five minutes a person. They're just going to talk about whatever they want to say and then they'll take two questions and we'll just kind of keep it to five minutes. So we're not going to sit down or anything. We're just going to sort of go where the artist's work is and we'll move on to the next person. So take it away, Steve Hollinger. This is his work. So these are um, two pieces I made. That one I made about um, five years ago and this one's pretty recent. Just about maybe in the fall I made this one. Um, my name is Steve Hollinger, you heard that, and I want to thank Heidi and George Fifield and the first cyber arts and all the work that we've done so thank you. It's already a minute and a half. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, no more thank you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no more time. Okay, so this piece uh, is named Quadruline, and it was after about a year of doing a lot of research on the atomic age, and I'm not going to get too like literal about what artwork is about, but this is what it was for me, learning about the atomic age and learning about a period in history when science arrived with unmanageable consequences. So it dealt with issues of fallibility, certainty, confidence, these things that we deal with every day. And I, I, ha I have saying, a saying I've said to my friends recently that works in some situations and doesn't work in others, but Sometimes I think confidence is overrated, and I, I continue to say that confidence is something we need to think about. This piece is about more or less certainty and fallibility during the atomic age. Kwajalein was an island in the Pacific, that's what it's named after. It was one of the islands, and I did a whole series of sculptures, each one named after one of the islands or one of the test sites during the atomic age. And we actually tested over a, a thousand atomic weapons, atmospheric, underground, and in the Pacific. And on this island, Kwajalein, in the Pacific, they moved a lot of the natives off these islands. Um, and the natives ended up being affected anyways by fallout, but uh, they did so much testing out in the Pacific and, and, and uh, atmospheric testing that people in New York City were experiencing fallout in rainwater. It got pretty serious. And, and in fact, the, they stopped doing um, atmospheric testing because of complaints from the East Coast, not because of complaints from out there. But anyway, so the piece just meant for me, what I was trying to do with the bottle generally is try to capture in my mind, how do you capture the intensity of the power of these atomic weapons in, in something? And what does it mean to you to capture power and concentrate it in a place and then have it contain and, and manage it and deal with it and so on? And is that something that you need to take responsibility for? So that, that's, to me, what the piece is about. All the materials are from that era. The box is an original crate that was used for carrying explosives during the 1940s. The testing went on from like 45 to maybe 1965. Um, and all the materials to make that jellyfish are polarizing materials that were developed by Edwin Land. He was one of the people that started Polaroid, but he also worked on some of the atomic, um, atomic weapons. And I, I used all Polaroid film and polarizing material for the atomic series of sculptures. So that's about two and a half minutes. I'm going to <laughs> This piece is called Subterranean. And um, I started having this idea, and I'm working on this series of sculptures that are in these tanks. 
they're all like kind of rooms in my mind. I'm not sure where, where I'll end up, but basically it came from this idea that when you look forward into your future, you have this infinite future. You can do anything and make decisions, and we all can make an infinite number of decisions right now. But then when you look behind you, you look at the thread of your life, and it's, it's something that actually has moments in time that are very sequential. You know the decisions you made. Some were good decisions, and some were terrible decisions, but, they, but you made them, and they're not infinite. They're along a very kind of sequential line that you can kind of look back on and reflect on. So I started making a sculpture for me that meant, like, how do you, how do you look at time and moments in time and discrete moments, future, past, and present in these spaces um, that we occupy? Now, when I tell you what these sculptures mean for me, I know they mean something different from anyone who looks at them, and that, that actually is great, because I, I don't really like writing a lot, putting on the wall what you should think when you look at the sculptures. So these descriptions are mostly what they, they mean to me. And I've had people come up to me after a show, I mean, one time, a woman came up to me after one show and she said, Steve, I love that one piece in the corner, you look down in there and you see a hair dryer. And I knew it wasn't a hair dryer, <laughs> but it didn't really matter. What mattered was she loved the piece, she was connecting with it. So I hope that you have an opportunity in some way to connect with these pieces. And George, George is here, I, I want to thank you, George, for cyber arts. Because I will say this, the idea... Okay, Heidi. Okay, Heidi, I already thanked Heidi. I, oh, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, quick comment about cyber arts. Generally, people, there's a, there's a distance between art, technology, mainly because you, you have this wall and this kind of gee whiz factor that goes on. But a guy like George and a lot of people in this show and a lot of people out there understand that art is about enlightenment and spirit, spiritual thinking and, and things like that. Using technology as a tool to express something you couldn't express any other way. And I think, I know George understands that, and that's really why it's really nice to have this show in Boston. It's not just like a geeky show where it's just about the latest technology. I doubt you'll go anywhere and just see the latest technology. But anyways, thank you all for coming, and if you have any questions, I'll quickly answer. That was exactly five minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> just one quick question. You make your pieces solar powered, so you, I assume you, so you don't have to plug them in, but you have to plug in the lights to make them run. Right. What, why? Good, yeah, good question. But my pieces are almost all either static, not moving, but actually expressing movement in some way, or drawing energy from the ambient environment. Now these pieces in a gallery, you have no choice, you have to put lights behind them. They're made actually to be in sunlight, so they're made to be in, in windows or in my, in my studio. I have no lights anywhere, they're, they're, they're all in sunlight. So when the sun comes up, the pieces come to life. And there's a reason for that. Again, I'm not using solar power because it's this, this uh, energy du jour. I've been using solar power for uh, you know, a decade before it was popular. And the reason I use solar power for my pieces is very simple. I like the idea of creating a piece that's isolated, independent, and doesn't rely on any, anyone else for its existence. It doesn't ask you to plug it in. It doesn't ask you to give it batteries. It doesn't even care if you exist. It, it exists on its own, and that way these pieces can really express some power in themselves. They don't require your, your um, coming along. And, and George, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, but George once said to me at the installation of a show, he came to my studio and he said, Steve, I'm really uncomfortable leaning over and looking at this piece. Like I have to like lean way over and look at it. Is there any way you could get a taller pedestal? I said, George, I don't care if you're uncomfortable. The piece doesn't care. You actually, it's meant for you to be uncomfortable. And George was like, perfect. <laughs> said, so, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay, perfect. But um, I think I'll wrap it up there because we're running late. So thank you all again. And uh, appreciate you coming. Thank you. But let's start with this anyway. Uh, this one, uh, falling, um, is, you know, it's really hard to know how to talk about any of these things. Because <laughs> um, um, I just, the, the process of making them is really about following the sort of instinctual patterns that are deeply embedded, embedded in my brain. And I don't know exactly where they're coming from, but, but uh, somehow they take shape. Um, but I think um, this has ended up being about reflection and self-reflection and um, um, the idea is when you put your 
head in this frame here. There's a little rest for your chin. And uh, you become surrounded by yourself um, uh, in amidst this forest of falling chain, um, almost like rain. And um, uh, the mirrors are, such, are, are, are created such that you see yourself in, a, in, a, in your reflection as other people actually see you in real life, not as you normally think of seeing yourself in, in the reflection in the mirror. So um, this is a sort of a double reflection. It's a, a reflected reflection. Um, so it's a photographic image of yourself. And, it, and for a lot of people, it's a little disconcerting because they, they know that they're seeing themselves, but they're seeing themselves in a way that they don't usually see themselves in the mirror. And it's slightly, um, um, they don't know exactly why it's disconcerting, but it is. <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> And then if you do something like stick your finger up, then you realize, wait a second, the finger's over there, not over here. <laughs> um, uh, and, and really, that's, uh, that's just due to a little trick um, uh, with right angle front surface mirrors so that you, uh, they're actually, you're looking at a, uh, you're looking into the corner of a mirror, not actually into a flat surface. Um, a side effect of that, which is actually kind of a, was never intended, but it's kind of interesting, is that when you when you uh, look inside there, you'll see that the seam of the, the mirrors actually crosses down your pupil, both pupils. So no matter where you look in the box, you're always you always see a split on your pupils, um, which is also disconcerting. <coughs> um, but other than that, I, I, I think the aim of this was really to, to create this sort of meditative atmosphere in which to submerse yourself and see yourself in a different way. And um, I hope that it does that. Hello. <laughs> well, that was two and a half minutes. You can take two questions. <clears throat> Excellent. Any questions? None questions. Excellent. <laughs> 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 well, I'm happy to see the floor, or we can talk about the other piece if you want. Uh, talk about the other piece. <clears throat> yeah, it's a little hard since it's not in front of us, but um, uh, that piece actually is, is, is a rather old piece. Um, it's been around for a while, and, and it's, an, it's kind of an old favorite of mine. Um, as I said, it was, it was originally inspired by waving grass, uh, and also it has this kind of hypnotic quality to it. I, uh, and a sort of a dance quality to it. Um, I like to think of it as sort of this hypnotic dance, really. Um, it goes through a cycle where uh, it sways in more and more of a, an arc, and then back and less and less of an arc. And um, uh, I think it's, in, in some ways, um, the feeling of this piece is reaches back into a feeling that I often have just in my normal days where I, I, I tend to sway a lot. <laughs> and uh, there's something about that movement that feels just very human and um, uh, also stimulating to me. So anyway, any questions about that? Did you enjoy mousetrap as a kid? No, I never it's played mousetrap. Mouse mm. I never, never did. played with mousetrap. I never did play mousetrap. You mouse kind of get yourself a... I know mouse. about it. I know about it. And uh, I never really... It's a little mousetrap. Left on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I prefer it's the, live, the live trap. It's from 1994, and so, so that's how old it is. Right, thank you. Yeah. With that piece over there, how chaotic is the movement on top? Like the, the part on the bottom seems very regimented. I mean, yeah. it's very precise. Well, it's it should be. I mean, it should be fairly precise. I mean, it's not meant to be particularly chaotic in there. So I just wonder how much chaos the strings. I mean, like if you were to graph that, would you see it's actually very periodic the way things move on top compared to how things move on bottom? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Straight yeah. This guy. Oh. Oh, go on. I have a comment. Yes. Which is the, what, the name of one of my favorite exhibits ever. There's a very famous book on the impact of technology in our lives called The Machine in the Garden. Oh. And a number of years ago, an MIT student from Nebraska 
just decided in the big rotunda to plant an entire field of wheat. Hmm. And the name he gave it was the garden in the machine. Oh, that's very funny. And I, can think of it, <laughs> and I think of it every time I see that piece. <laughs> that's nice. That's nice. Too. I would also just like to, uh, you know, Steve made a very lovely thank you to George and Heidi for the Cyber Arts Festival. I think it's actually kind of ironic that this show is part of the Cyber Arts Festival because there's nothing cyber about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and I, I, I think it's very, it's a wonderful kind of irony, which I embrace. So. <laughs> I'm fired. <laughs> What's that? I guess I'm fired. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Two pieces that I have in this show are are very new and very different uh, in the way that I normally work, and um, I think that that it's not possible to separate one's work from one's life. So, of course, I think what I'm making now is is a reflection of all the things that are going on inside of my life. Um, this this piece here is really. I, I, for me, it was just a humorous poke. I, I, I've been, I've been uh, looking or uh, listening a lot to uh, Buddhist uh, uh, Dharma talks and reading about Buddhism and very interested in, in what that is. And I feel very resonant with, with, uh, with Buddhist thought. So I just had this thought that I would make a kind of a humorous piece that would address what Buddhism calls the first noble truth, which is basically that there is suffering. And uh, there, there, are, there are four noble truths of Buddhism. And the first is there is suffering. The second is that we suffer because we cling. The third is that we can, we can release our suffering if we let go of clinging. And then the fourth is the program of how to actually do that. And Maybe I'll make, I, I have thoughts about making a series of pieces that would address the whole, uh, all four of the, of the noble truths of Buddhism just as a, as a playful way. Now, I, I, I feel like there are, there are an infinite number of ways to express it, and this is just one little thought that I had that, uh, and I, 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 I had so, I'd become so engrossed in actually sewing up these little dolls because I had I had purchased a few years ago this little cloth doll from like some like craft store and then when I wanted to make this piece I couldn't find another one and I it's like oh I gotta actually sew it up and I'm telling you I am like in love with just the process and I feel like that even doing that has connected me uh, I, I I made ten, the, the bodies, the parts of bodies for ten men, or ten figures. Uh, it's, 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 the, the figure is very um, deliberately not male or female, or um, I don't want it to be any particular uh, uh, race. And I think that there may be a number of pieces that sort of come out of sort of this, this, this will be sort of a character. And I did have the thought, because he, he's the first one off the assembly line of actually numbering them, and I forgot to put, I forgot to write a number on it. But that actually kind of segues into the other piece, which is kind of an intense piece for me. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen that. It's a very, um, it's it's called Machine for Softening Hardened Hearts, and uh, it's it's a piece that that when I try to talk about it, I I, I almost have no idea of how to actually put it into words because um, because it's kind of a challenging thing I um, the, the the moment I had the, the thought to make that piece and if you haven't seen it 
it's a very simple mechanism uh, with, with a little pom-pom, and the little pom-pom is sort of caressing the region of Adolf Hitler's heart. And I had the impulse to make this because it felt so vile and despicable when I, when I first had the thought. But, but it came out of the conversation that Shahalis and I were having. The morning, the morning that I had the imagination to do that piece, she had asked the question um, of, of a priest, shouldn't we uh, be praying for the devil? And uh, I think that it opens up lots of questions. So uh, I, I, I have no idea, I have no idea how anybody would respond to that piece, and maybe not at all, which is great. But for me, um, I, I made it because I wanted, to, I wanted to create a kind of utilitarian tool that I could go up to and basically face myself. Because my, my, my impulse is to say, there's no way, there's no way that I would ever do anything like that to that, that uh, horrible creature. And uh, to, 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 to show any tenderness. But, but underneath that, for me, is a, is, is a desire to want to stop blaming others and to look more carefully at what's going on inside of me, and uh, to um, to look at what we what we label in in the world, we label things as evil, and there are like there are horrible things going on all the time. There is this like we are overwhelmed with evil, but but. I would like to, at least for myself, try to turn that around and see it as spiritual sickness. Because if, if I can see it as sickness and not as evil, then there's a possibility for healing. So it's that, that those are the thoughts that are behind that, that piece. I, I have no idea if that, I mean, that, that piece is a, it's a strange piece. It's, you know, it will, will, anyway, any questions? <laughs> We have time for two questions for Arthur. If there are any, otherwise it has been five minutes. Okay. Oh, there's a question. Andy. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm used to looking at your pieces and seeing every single part of it as being understandable in terms of what it does. And I'm looking at that right where the, the um, that rod comes down and connects with the poker rod. There's a little zigzag. Right what, here? Yeah, that thing. And I'm oh. wondering, is that like a little shock absorber? Or no, <laughs> what no. What is the function of That's that? That's very utilitarian. Tell me what that does. It's a way of adjusting the length after the fact. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, I, I've loved your work for a long time, and whenever I look at it, I wonder if there's ongoing maintenance that you have to do. Like, will yes. the little man's head eventually fall off and you'll have to replace him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and when I came into the gallery, uh, I noticed that his body was kind of tilted over more, so I actually did use that little thing, and I took my pliers, and I made it a little bit longer, so it hit it a little more. Oh, yeah. The rule is, with, with all kinetic work, if it moves, it'll break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a matter of time. <laughs> That's the rule we can't get around. Yeah. Thank you like also to Heidi and George for creating the space. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Take a look at his piece. It's called Dream Time. Uh, it's hand carved figure. It's pretty hypnotic to watch. She actually never displaces the sand, which is very uh, miraculous to me. So.
that there was a theme with my work where I was, uh, you know, putting myself in this this area where there was like a little girl that was like lost in this world. And when I was young, I always used to have nightmares and I would always imagine myself to, in a place, a safe place with flowers and butterflies. So that's what that piece is. But that was piece was very specific about. Um, <laughs> Questions for Erica? Well, the music seems good. When did you start including music? Um, actually, I've been doing the music box for boxes for a while. Um, like that piece with the with the ballerinas, um, you know, you think of those little wind up ballerinas that have the music boxes, um, and like I feel like it kind of goes with the movement. Like she has, she's kind of singing, and her head is sort of bobbing to the music. I feel like it 
you know, sort of adds to the poetry of it, cutting the music. So are there like little tines inside, or how, how does the music generation actually happen? Um, well, I can take out the wall and show you. Oh, <laughs> is that permitted? Yeah. She's the artist, she can do it. It's actually quite simple. So this is the music box here, and then I just took um, the part that you turn off and made this little pulley system. So, so it's, it's like a found music box that you've modified? Yeah, so when you turn this, this pulley ah. turns the music box. And you'll see with that one out there, the newer one, um, the butterflies, this is me getting um, more technically proficient. <laughs> the butterflies, there's an, instead of just an up and down movement, there's an outward movement. <laughs> How, how do you design the little crank shaft thing? It's like really elaborate, and they're they're very interesting objects by themselves. Yeah, and they they seem to be in such like, well contrast content. Sort of my my process is I'll have a piece of wood. Like I I I sort of don't plan out exactly what this piece of wood is. It's sort of like you know cut here and cut there and then okay and then I and then so I have this and then I will just sort of think of the of what kind of landscape there can be in there and so like I think I painted this first because I thought this was the most interesting line in the wood and then I painted this and then so a lot of times my composition is built around the grain of the wood and um, I had these guys, these, these are part fig and part bird, and I had these guys for a long time, and like the, the hardest part of my work is, is the composition. It's like what I spend the most amount of time struggling over. So then I have this composition and I'm like, okay, I want to make this go up and down, I want to make her head move, and I want to make this go back and forth. And then it's just a process of determining like, okay, I want this bird to go from here to there. So divide that in half and that's how long the crankshaft will have to be up here. Okay. And like like here I wanted it to go this way. There's like little pins here. So you know basically the longest the longest crankshafts here are what pulls it back and forth. So the lengths of these sort of determine how how much movement there is. And these are just um, made with brass. I actually learned a lot of this sort of technical part having taken a class with Arthur like 10 years ago. It's a lot of jewelry making skill. Like these these are cut out these are actually cut out of metal because it gives them the weight that they need. It's not some people think it's just paper but it's not. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Yeah.